Welcome back to Season 3 of 12 Days in March. In this presentation, we'll begin our discussion of the nephritic syndromes, focusing on IgA nephropathy and post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis, which pretty much travel as a pair throughout Step 1. That is, your answer selection will frequently come down to choosing between the two. As a reminder, a PDF of this presentation is available at the website. In the introductory video, we reviewed the background features of nephritic syndrome, including renal insufficiency, hematuria, and the most characteristic feature, RBC casts. A subset of patients with nephritic syndrome may develop a rapidly progressive form of the disease characterized by crescent formation with severe renal injury. And finally, the nephritic patient will be described with some degree of hypertension, edema, and or proteinuria. All this information should be old news to you by now. In this presentation, we'll drill down on the information you'll need to know for the boards focusing on IgA nephropathy and post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis. In the next presentation, we'll tackle Wegner's and Good Pastures. So here goes. Let's start with what IgA nephropathy and post-streptococcal have in common. Both disorders are more common in children. They're both associated with an infectious trigger. Insofar as pathology, both can demonstrate a proliferative response on light microscopy, but rarely progress to rapidly progressive or crescentic glomerular nephritis. And finally, they both share in common the presence of hematuria, which might be described as dark or cola-colored urine and or the presence of RBC casts. And this is the extent of what they share in common. The question writers will take advantage of these overlap features, but ultimately it is the differences that will form the substance of test questions. So how they differ is the focus of the remainder of this video. Let's begin the discussion by examining the role of infection. Focusing first on IgA nephropathy, the diagnostic criteria is not dependent on the presence of infection, but it is a frequent trigger. Further, if you think about it, this is the boards. They'll be trying to trip you up with post-streptococcal, so the majority of IgA nephropathy vignettes will include a respiratory infection described as a flu-like illness. Remember, a flu-like illness does not equal a streptococcal infection. The other key point is the time course between infection and the development of symptoms. In IgA nephropathy, the patient will become symptomatic two to three days after their index infection. Contrast that with post-streptococcal. In post-streptococcal glomerular nephritis, the kid will be described with an infectious episode two to three weeks prior to the onset of symptoms. This is a very different time course and a major distinguishing feature. Further, the nature of those infections will be dramatically different. A flu-like illness compared with tonsillopharyngitis or a pyogenic skin infection. The timing and nature of the infection alone should permit you to deduce the correct diagnosis in the majority of questions. So you won't struggle with the diagnosis of strep pharyngitis. Be aware, however, that the skin infection may be described overtly as an episode of cellulitis or more covertly as a patient who was recently treated for an infection that was notable for honey-colored crusted skin lesions. So be prepared to distinguish the types of infections as well as their timing. All right, moving on to the hematuria, this is another major distinguishing characteristic. The patient with IgA nephropathy is more likely to be described with overt episodes of gross hematuria. But the big ticket item is the recurrent nature of the hematuria. This is the standout feature of the disorder. Compare and contrast that with post-streptococcal. These are isolated, generally self-limited episodes that complicate an acute infection. Whereas a patient can certainly have more than one post-streptococcal event, that is a different story than a patient presenting with recurrent gross hematuria. And here is how a classic vignette will play out on the boards. The patient presents with dark urine. The mom reports a similar episode last summer. Boom! Game, set, match. The kid has recurrent gross hematuria. With this description, the question writer just informed you that the diagnosis is IgA nephropathy. Be prepared to answer the derivative. So this is a third major distinguishing feature. But to be clear, the information on infection and hematuria is to set up the diagnosis. The majority of test questions, however, will target the pathology. As with all glomerulopathies, the pathology derivatives make up the majority of questions. So looking first at IgA nephropathy, if you are just acquainted with mesangial cell involvement and that smudgy appearing immunofluorescence, you will be in good shape. For post-streptococcal, you will need to be aware that circulating immune complexes deposit in the subendothelial space, triggering the acute proliferative response, and those same immune complexes can also be found in the subepithelial space, being described by humps. 
Let's ratchet it down a bit further to better understand what is going on with IgA nephropathy. It is always nice to reason things out rather than memorize. So I already mentioned that the mesangial cell is the key player. The image on the left is simply meant to demonstrate how mesangial cells are distributed or interspersed in the glomerulus. To visualize their scattered arrangement might help you better understand the pattern seen on immunofluorescence. The graphic to the right is to remind you that no component of the glomerulus works independent of the others. Damage or activation of the mesangium ultimately affects the other cellular elements with all roads leading to the glomerular basement membrane. Through cytokines, the mesangium, podocyte, and endothelial cell all communicate with one another. The other thing to note is what the mesangial cell actually does. I included an excellent reference on mesangial cell function, but for your purposes, you just need to be aware of these two key roles. The first is its ability to elaborate extracellular matrix. You are probably most familiar with this role in the nodular appearance it generates in the Kimmel-Steele-Wilson lesions of diabetic nephropathy. The other key role is its housekeeping function. It has the ability to phagocytize proteins and macromolecules that escape the vascular compartment. And this is what happens in IgA nephropathy. In this disorder, IgA polymers are thought to be abnormally glycosylated. It is these abnormal Ig polymers that are taken up by the mesangial cell. In the immunofluorescence image, immunostaining for IgA renders this classic image. It is a graphic you will need to be familiar with. I've included the light microscopy showing mesangial expansion, but without the immunofluorescence, you wouldn't know these represent IgA deposits. And that's it for the pathology of IgA nephropathy. So let's get into the more complex pathology issues present in post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. And here is the money. Acute proliferative glomerulonephritis. This is another graphic you will need to recognize. So what are we looking at? First, the phrase proliferative refers to the hypercellularity. The hypercellularity includes the presence of inflammatory cells as well as endothelial and mesangial expansion. What's driving this process? The subendothelial deposition of circulating immune complexes with complement activation. That's a mouthful. You should be aware that acute proliferative glomerulonephritis is not specific to post-streptococcal. Whereas this is the prototypical condition, light microscopy would be identical in a patient with SLE. Obviously, the vignettes will readily distinguish the two. Insofar as immunofluorescence, the deposits of immune complexes are readily identified and described by a granular appearance. I hate terms such as lumpy-bumpy and find them confusing. Be it granular or bumpy, the terms are meant to highlight the focal deposits of immune complexes as opposed to the linear appearance seen in good pastures. Moving on to electron microscopy, we have what seems to be a paradox, a sub-epithelial hump or deposit. We make such a big deal about circulating immune complexes depositing in the sub-endothelial space, triggering the proliferative response. So what is up with the sub-epithelial deposit? Here goes. So our patient is infected with a nephritogenic strain of group A strep. An antibody is formed against one of the extracellular streptococcal products presumed to be exotoxin B. The antigen antibody complex deposits in the sub-endothelial space, triggering the proliferative response. And here's the fun part. The antigen and antibody dissociate from one another. And once dissociated, the antigen and antibody separately migrate across the glomerular basement membrane. And here's my favorite. In the sub-epithelial compartment, they reassemble to form the hump. And that is where the sub-epithelial hump derives from. The end. I love that story. So when it comes to pathology, post-streptococcal is definitely more nuanced, but if you stay focused on the immune complexes and where they deposit, the pathology is fairly predictable. And just returning to the time course and considering the mechanism associated with immune complex injury, the longer latency between infection and glomerular damage makes sense. All right, let's review some key associations and then we're done. Insofar as clinical course, I'll again remind you we are dealing with all the bells and whistles associated with nephritic syndrome, including hypertension, edema, and mild proteinuria. Acute kidney injury will be evident, but the most important symptom will be glomerular bleeding. In terms of key associations, IgA nephropathy questions will intermingle with henoch schonlein purpurer, now called IgA vasculitis. Not surprisingly, the renal manifestations of IgA vasculitis is identical to that seen in IgA nephropathy. So be prepared to identify IgA nephropathy in a kid presenting with the tetrada symptoms including purpura, GI bleeding, joint pain, and gross hematuria. 
I use the mnemonic shark to recall the tetrad. You can make up your own, but whatever mnemonic you use, make sure you can identify IgA nephropathy in the setting of Henoch Schonlein purpura, aka IgA vasculitis. Insofar as loose ends with post-streptococcal, you will need to be able to identify the type of hypersensitivity reaction associated with immunologic injury. In rheumatic fever, the immune injury is related to molecular mimicry and cross-reactivity against fixed tissue targets. This is a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction. In post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, the damage is related to circulating immune complexes, and this is consistent with type 3 hypersensitivity. There is some debate over the exact mechanism of injury, but for now, if they ask, assume it to be a type 3 reaction. Besides urine studies, creatinine elevation, and renal biopsy, you should be familiar with serologic studies that define exposure to strep infection. To be clear, if they describe a derm infection or tonsillopharyngitis, you are good, but sometimes they just offer serologic evidence of infection. Anastreptolysin would be most common, but you should have passing familiarity with the other possible tests, just in case. Insofar as complement, the majority of patients will have decreased levels. This, of course, is not specific. More importantly, I've seen them use complement in the reverse. That is, they give a nephritic presentation and report normal complement levels. In this instance, the question writer is telling you the patient does not have post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. I already mentioned that kids are more commonly affected than adults, but kids also have a favorable outcome compared with adults, with 95% recovering uneventfully. As such, supportive therapy is generally all that is required. And just to emphasize, age is a prognosticator with older age having less favorable outcomes. And finally, I just want to emphasize that steroids play no role in treatment. I did mention this during the nephrotic syndrome video, but want to again highlight that whereas minimal change does benefit from steroid therapy, it plays no role in post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. And that will do it for these two players. The character of infection and pattern of hematuria will set you up for the key pathology derivatives come test day. With this info, you're guaranteed to get 99% of the questions. If you have any questions or concerns about any of this material, please email me at 12 days. Thank you.